Church, I invite you to take your Bibles this evening as we begin this new series through Titus, and you can open your Bibles to Titus chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to begin to read in that very spot, read down through verse 4, which is the salutation or the greeting of Paul to his son in the faith, Titus, and you will find these words, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true child and a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you and we thank you again for this joyful occasion to open up your word and to be able to study together. We ask that you would encourage us and build up our faith We ask that as we embark on this study, as we look for the next couple of months to this letter that was penned by the Apostle Paul to Titus regarding the church on this island known as Crete, that you would help us to make application to our own lives, our own personal lives, and our own church life. We pray that you would build us up as Christian families, strengthen our individual faith, and also we pray that you would set in order our own ministry here at Praise Mill, that we would be seeking to honor you in all that we say, in all that we do, and how we sing, and how we organize ministry, that it, would, that it would all be done for your praise, and your honor, and your glory, and we ask this, in Christ's name, amen. Verses 1 through 4 serve as the greeting or the salutation. Now, the background for this specific letter, again, was was written to Titus, who was left there on this island that was some 160 miles long and 7 miles to 35 miles wide, and was there southeast of Asia Minor and yet north of Africa in a strategic location. And Paul had visited this very island with Titus on a missionary journey. And yet he leaves Titus there for the very purpose of doing what? Verse 5 tells us in the opening words of this letter, to set in order the things that remained. In in other words, the church there was young and immature, and there was much to be ordered as far as the ministry life of the local church on this island that we know as Crete. And yet, Paul had a special relationship with Titus. But what we need to see is that this church was located on this island that was strategically located because it was located Uh, very near trade routes and obviously would have been influenced by the Greek and the Roman civilization, that the Cretan church had attracted many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those, Paul says, of the circumcision, of the circumcision. If you go back to uh, places there in the New Testament, you can see Paul is writing those very words. He is saying that this church had been influenced by men who were of the circumcision. We see this in in Paul's letter to Timothy. But as we think about this particular context, we must note that one historian said it this way, it was almost impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous and public policy more unjust than in Crete. So in other words, Titus had a daunting task. He was facing many injustices in his culture, and he was facing many sins in the local church. The sinful living of the public arena had infiltrated the church. False teachers had influenced the church, and many injustices plagued the church in the public arena. And so this task would prove itself to be extremely difficult. Titus had to set in order to organize the ministry of the local church, the gospel ministry of the local church for the glory of God. So he faced challenges in the church there, faced challenges of idleness or slothfulness, corruption, false teaching, and disorderly conduct, and a disorganized ministry. So these Cretans had a reputation for being idle and somewhat corrupt. 
You can see that if you look at verse number 12 of this opening chapter. You see it says that Paul is quoting from one of the Cretans' own prophets, and he says that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So as we consider the gospel-centered purpose for Paul's word here to Titus, we need to see three specific things that Paul was wanting to drive home here in these first four verses. First of all, we see Paul as the author of Titus. And then we can look down and we can see Paul's purpose in writing to Titus. And then we can see Paul's greeting specifically to Titus. So first of all, the author of Titus here in the New Testament is none other than Paul. It's none other than Paul. Whenever we're studying the Bible, it's it's extremely important for us to understand three key principles as we're, as we're working our way through a text of Scripture. We need to ask ourselves three key questions. Who wrote this biblical text? Who was the original audience when this text was written? And why did the author pin these words? So who wrote it? Who was the recipient? And why was it written? And as we consider these three questions, that's a very important way for us to to drill down to the original meaning and the original context. And at that point, we can then apply the text to ourselves. So first of all, who is the author? And we see in verse number one, the very first word that we see is the name, the proper name, Paul. So we know that Paul is the author of this very letter. Now, Paul had been a, a man who had the highest possible pedigree as it pertains to the Jewish mindset. According to Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, he says these words, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He said this, verse number 5 of Philippians 3, Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, and as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So that's the pedigree, that's the resume, the spiritual resume of this man that we know as Paul before his conversion. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He had studied under Gamaliel. He was a persecutor of the Christian church. He checked all of the boxes according to the Jewish population and the hierarchy of the Jewish leadership, specifically that of the Sanhedrin. And yet, as we read on in the New Testament, specifically there in the book of Acts, we find that Paul was a lover of terrorism. He was a, he was a persecutor of the church. He was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. And yet he was also a licensed terrorist. For at the very moment of his conversion, we find that Saul of Tarsus, later we would see his name be changed to Paul, he was on the way and on his road to Damascus when Jesus Christ appeared to him and changed him and saved him. But yet before that dramatic conversion, this terrorist, licensed terrorist, had a racist heart in many ways. He was consumed with ethnic pride, as many Jews were. They looked down upon the Gentile. They believed that the Gentile were uh, that, that, that the Gentile population in and of themselves were nothing more than simply filthy dogs. They were they were filthy scavenger-like individuals, considered to be in many ways barbarians. They were considered to be outcasts. They were considered to be unclean. And so that would have been the mindset of Paul before his conversion. Paul before his conversion. And yet, as we think about the culture in which we live present day, and we consider the, the circumstances that we face present day, and so much talk about racism and how to get rid of racism and social justice jargon, consider the words of my friend Daryl Harrison who said it this way, quote, Many say that they want to end racism. He says, I get what they mean, but racism isn't like a carton of milk with an expiration date. Biblically, ethnic prejudice is not an ism. It is a hate, period, he says. 
You end hatred by repenting and believing the gospel, end quote. The way that we get rid of ethnic prejudice and racism is through a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. When Jesus changes us, it takes our mind and it transforms it. It transforms our heart. We have a new heart that longs for godliness and longs for justice and longs to love people, to love our neighbor as ourself. And yet, that's what we see happening in the very life of Paul. Spurgeon said, Paul was a great man, and I have no doubt that on the way to Damascus, he rode a very high horse. But a few seconds sufficed to alter the man, how soon God brought him down. Now, later, Paul would say, the very man who writes this letter to Titus, that he was the chief of sinners, or that he considered himself to be the least of the apostles. Now, why would he make that statement? He made that statement because he saw himself as one who had once persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. But consider what Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, quote, the gospel is open to all. The most respectable sinner has no more claim on it than the worst. So no, no matter how bad someone has been, no matter how far someone has gone, they're not beyond the reach of the sovereign grace of a sovereign God. So I ask you at the very opening of this sermon, in this, this very letter that we're studying here, known as Titus, who have you given up on in your prayer life? When we consider how God saved this, this persecutor of the church known as Saul of Tarsus, when we consider the dramatic conversion of the Apostle Paul, who did you once pray for? Did you once have a desire to reach? That you were once longing to share the gospel with, with confidence that God would save them, but now you've been shrinking back. Now you're silent. Now, now you're not sharing the gospel openly as you once did. And now you're not praying for them with great confidence of God's saving work as you once had. I want to encourage you to continue praying and to continue sharing the gospel, knowing that God can save anyone. If he can save Paul, he can save anyone. So keep praying and keep sharing the gospel. Second of all, we see, as we learn Paul as the author of this very letter, we, we note that Paul says that he is a servant of God. He is a servant of God. The word here, servant, is the Greek term doulos, and it literally means that of a slave. In fact, all of the Greek terms that find themselves in the group that are related to the Greek term doulos, regardless of their ending and regardless of their variations, they are all pointing to the idea of slavery. Now, as we study the New Testament, we have this knowledge that the Greeks had a strong sense of freedom and they had personal dignity that demanded this freedom. And so they were resistant against any idea of slavery. They resisted the idea of slavery. They longed for freedom. They were champions of freedom. And yet, we see here that as we survey the New Testament, that Jesus often uses the term related to a slave by way of illustration. During the time of the New Testament, you would find slaves working in vineyards, laboring in fields, or inviting guests to a wedding, or facilitating household duties, or assisting the family with various tasks. And so the idea of doulos, or a slave, was commonplace during the time of the writing of the New Testament. It was part of the fabric, if you will, of their culture. And so Jesus would often use it as a means of illustration. And we find that Paul does the very same thing. As he references himself, first and foremost, not as an apostle, as he's going to talk about in just a moment, but he starts off with this idea of his position, which is that of a slave. He is a slave of Jesus. The word here denotes the idea of exclusive ownership or complete and total submission or a singular devotion. So when we see that we ourselves are called servants of God because we have been saved by God, we, we, should, we, we should see ourselves as compelled to serve. We are compelled to be subjects of Jesus. 
And so that's oftentimes what we see as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verses 19 through 20, when Paul writes this to the church in the city of Corinth. He says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul doesn't promote this idea of himself or anyone else within the Christian community as a rogue, independent, utterly independent and free Christian to just roam where you want to do, have no submission whatsoever to authority, and ultimately no submission to Christ. That's not at all the way that the New Testament reads. Paul says, I am a doulos, I am a servant, I am a slave of Jesus. Second of all, Paul describes himself as the apostle of Jesus. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word here for apostle in the Greek literally means to send someone forth with the authority of God. To send someone on a mission with the authority of God. So as they speak, For God, they come with the authority of God. And so Paul was sent by God to proclaim the truth under the authority of God for the glory of God. That's what an apostle should do. And so that was his main ambition, was to preach Jesus. That was the work of an apostle. And so Paul, wherever he went, whether it was in the city or whether it was in the country, whether it was on a boat or whether it was in a synagogue, whether it was in jail or whether it was before kings, or before common men in a marketplace, wherever Paul was, he saw himself as a servant who would speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was consistently preaching Jesus. Every time that we see Paul preaching, Jesus is at the center. He was a Jesus preacher. Spurgeon once said, a sermon without Christ is in It's an awful thing. It is a horrible thing, he said. And so we see that Paul is the author of Titus. Second of all, in verses 1 down through verse 3, we see Paul's goal for the church at Crete. First of all, we see that Paul had a goal for the church's salvation. Notice, if you will, in verse number 1, he says he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice, for, here's the purpose, I'm writing this for the sake of the faith of God's elect. For the sake of the faith of God's elect. When he speaks about God's elect, he's undoubtedly pointing to the doctrine of election. That God had chosen individuals on this island mass of 160 miles long by some 35 miles wide at the widest point. God had chosen among the council of the Trinity individuals that were on this landmass unto himself. And God had committed to giving them to Christ. And yet they were chosen, they were elected by God before time began. But yet it was the will of God to send Paul as an apostle to preach the good news so that they could be saved. You see, Paul understood the doctrine of God's sovereignty, that yet God does choose people unto himself, but they don't just come to saving faith by spontaneous combustion. They don't just automatically believe. They don't just suddenly just poof into the faith. But they must hear the gospel proclaimed. Without the preaching of the gospel, there will be no salvation. But it is God's plan and God's order of the way that salvation works for God to save sinners through the preaching and the proclamation of the gospel. So when he speaks about God's elect, this is what he's saying. God has purposed for me to have a ministry in Crete so that souls would be saved and so that the church would be built there on this island for the sake of the faith. The faith, the saving faith, the word here is pistis in the Greek. It means the 
confidence and the certainty and the, the belief. The belief. But God's grace works this way. Titus chapter 3, we're going to see this. Later on in chapter 3, he said, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. God had mercy on us. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. God is the one who causes the heart of an unbeliever to be born again. It is by the hearing of the gospel that, as Paul would say to the church in the city of Rome in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And it is through the preaching and the proclamation of the good news whereby the Spirit of God takes that message and causes the heart of an unbeliever to be born again. But yet, as we consider the word elect here, to, to choose of God's elect, John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So the reason that individuals here that make up this church and those who are still outside of the faith that would eventually make up this church, the reason that they would be born again or that they had already been born again is because God had mercy upon them. God had mercy on their soul. God brought them to faith. And so this is the purpose. First purpose we see is for the church's salvation. Second of all, we see that Paul had a purpose for the church's discipleship, for the church's formation, for the church's maturity. Notice, if you will, at the end of verse number one, what he says. If you have your copy of God's word open to Titus 1, notice what he says. Not only for the faith of God's elect, but also their knowledge of the truth. Their knowledge of the truth. Paul's second goal that he lists here for his purpose in writing to Titus here regarding the church on the island of Crete is so that they would be strengthened in their knowledge of God and His grace. The knowledge of the truth. Ask yourself this question. How will the church ever grow to spiritual maturity if the church doesn't grow in the knowledge of the truth? How will young people ever rise up and assume offices of deacon and elder in a local church? How will the church grow to avoid pitfalls of lawlessness and injustice and sin and debauchery and all sorts of, of vile things outside of the proper knowledge of the truth. So it is God's will and it is God's purpose for the truth to be proclaimed and for God's church to grow and to be discipled. That was God's will from the very beginning for his church. That was God's will for the church in the very day on this very island as Paul writes this letter to Titus. And it is God's will for us here at Praise Mill in this present hour. How will the church grow without the knowledge of God? The word knowledge here is a specific Greek term that refers to clear perception of truth. Clear perception of truth. And so, as we consider this idea of the church's growing in knowledge, we need to consider the fact that we have so many ministries today that are built on other foundations other than knowledge and truth. Far too many church ministries have been and have become game-centered rather than truth-centered. They are man-centered rather than God-centered. In other words, so you see this in, in youth ministry, and you see it in, in all sorts of different areas within evangelicalism, where they try to figure out ways to grow the church by fun and games. They have all sorts of ideas. I was made aware recently of a church in our own area that has bought PS4s for a, a gaming room on their campus to attract the youth in their community to come. And, 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 and I've also been made aware of the fact that this same church has a yoga class. Now, if you know anything about yoga, yoga is not interested in knowledge. It's not interested in truth. It's interested in disconnect. It's certainly not driving to this idea of a growing knowledge. 
But yet what we see is that Paul says that the church on this island of Crete is to be growing in knowledge. Oftentimes churches are feeling-centered and they design their worship service in in a certain way so that they can evoke a certain feeling or so that they can cause people to rise to a climax. And you'll see this in the way that they arrange their song service and the song selection and the way that they arrange the, the singing and the music and the instruments to accompany the congregation and to lead the congregation in singing. It's all about a feeling. But yet we don't see that that's the way that Paul describes that the church should be ordered here. As we think about this very letter, this letter was written for the purpose of a gospel-ordered ministry and life. As we consider the idea of a gospel-ordered ministry, the ministry should not be disconnected from truth. In order for the church to grow properly and for the glory of God, it must be growing as it pertains to the proper knowledge of God. That's why we can't have this idea that Growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of God in a serious-minded approach to Bible study and preaching and the teaching of God's Word is for the spiritually elite, or it's for the seminary classroom, but it's not for me. I just want to feel a certain way. I just want that quote-unquote old-time religion, or I just want to make sure that I have that fuzzy feel-good when I leave. That's not what Paul says here. He has a goal for the church to grow in the knowledge of God. And any pastor who stands in a pulpit on a weekly basis should come to the pulpit with that agenda. There should be an agenda in that individual's sermon every single time to drive the church to have a greater knowledge of God for the glory of God. It's not a a feeling-centered ministry or an emotionally driven ministry It's a knowledge of truth-centered ministry. Discipleship involves the Bible at the very center. And so there should be the building up of the saints through the Bible, the the exhortation of the church through the Scriptures, the stirring up of the church through the gospel that is proclaimed, the encouraging of the church through the preached word, the reproval of the church through the proclamation of truth. And on and on we go through the process of discipleship. James Montgomery Boyce once described the evangelical church in his day during his ministry. He said it was, quote, unquote, mindless times. And so many people today resist this idea of growing in knowledge. But when we read the Bible, we see that we should be striving to know God with our mind. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart soul, mind, and strength. We know God as a servant knows his king. Psalm 24.10, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. We know God as a sheep knows his shepherd. John 10.27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. We know God as a child knows his father. Matthew 6, 9 says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. J.I. Packer, in his excellent book, Knowing God, comes to the very end of his book. He's written an entire book about knowing God. And this is what he says, quote, from current Christian publications, you might think that the most vital issue for any real or would-be Christian in the world today is church unity, or social witness, or dialogue with other Christians and other faiths, or refuting this or that ism, or developing a Christian philosophy and culture, or what have you. But our line of study makes the present day concentration on these things look like a gigantic conspiracy of misdirection. Of course, it is not that the issues themselves are real and that they must be dealt with in their place. But it is tragic that in paying attention to them, all of these issues he's describing, so many in our day seem to have been distracted from what was, is, and always will be the true priority for every human being, that is, learning to know God in Christ, end quote. 
That is our duty as a Christian to know God, to pursue God, and to know Him even with our mind. So we should give ourselves to rigorous reading and study of the Bible. We also see Paul has this ambition, this goal for the church's not only salvation and discipleship, but also the church's sanctification. The gospel orders, sets in order, the functionality of the church and the personal lifestyle of the believer. Notice what he says here in verse number one. Again, he speaks of the knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. Paul mentions our knowledge of God as our knowledge of God grows, that it would increase our godliness. In other words, the the more that we get to know God, the more that we desire to be like Him. The, The more that we read about God, and the more we contemplate His holiness, as Leviticus says, and then is quoted again in the New Testament, that we are to be holy as God is holy. The more that we contemplate God, the more that we read about God, the more that we see and study God in the pages of Holy Scripture, we desire to shed sin, to repent of sin, to distance ourselves from sin, and to cling to God, and to desire to be not like the world, but to be like God. That is the idea here. The word here, godliness, is the word for piety or that of godliness. Again, uh, to quote verse 12 of chapter number 1, the, the people here on the island of Crete, their community in general, they were called liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons. And so that was not to be what characterized or what described the local church on this island. Paul said, Titus, you need to drive this point home to the Christian church on this island. Is that they can't be like the community, lazy. They can't be like the community, liars and gluttons. They must be holy as God is holy. Last of all, in verses 2 and 3, we see that Paul had an ambition to labor for the church's assurance of salvation. Notice he says in verse number 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies, unlike the common community on the island of Crete, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. In other words, what he's saying here is that the church should have their hope in Christ, in Christ alone. And he speaks of eternal life, that their hope should be in their eternal life. John 10, 28 and 29 says, Jesus is speaking and he says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. In other words, we need to understand that the Christian has eternal life, not temporal life, not temporary salvation or temporary grace or temporary atonement or temporary mercy or temporary justification or temporary glorification. Eternal life. We need to note that God saved us. He guards us. And our hope is secure in Him. He speaks about the God who never lies. In other words, you can always trust God. If God says it, you can take it to the bank. And notice this, He puts the emphasis on God's Word, that it has been manifest in God's Word. It's been manifested in His Word through the preaching that's been entrusted to Paul. So what had previously been concealed had now been revealed, namely that of the gospel of Jesus Christ, namely that of the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises that have come to fulfillment in Jesus. So here's the way that we can say this. In God's Word, this is why the Word of God must be central in all of our Bible studies, in everything that we do in the life of this church, is that in general, in general revelation, by the creation itself, we come to see that there is a God. But in special revelation, in God's Word, we come to know God. And that was what Paul was laboring for, 
as Titus was to set in order the ministry of the local church on the island of Crete. Finally, we see not only the author of Titus and the goal of Titus, why it is that Paul wrote this very letter, but last of all, we see Paul's greeting to Titus in verse number four. First, we see a Christian relationship that is revealed to us. Notice verse four, he says, to Titus, my true child, in a common faith. So Titus, my true child, in the Greek, this would literally be a way of saying, this is my authentic child. This is my legitimate child, as opposed to that of an illegitimate child. But obviously, Paul was not the father in the biological sense of Titus, but he was his spiritual father. He had, he had discipled this man. And so he's saying, this is a legitimate convert. This is someone who can be, who can be trusted. He's not a false teacher. He's someone who has demonstrated genuine saving grace. He is someone who exemplifies the fruit of the Spirit. He is someone who is, who is walking and gaining maturity in the faith. So you can trust him. You can trust him as he speaks for me. But most importantly, you can trust him as he proclaims the truth of the gospel of God. He speaks at the end of verse number two, or excuse me, at the end of verse number three, about this, what's been entrusted to Paul, again, the, the revelation of God through the word of God has been entrusted to Paul, and now here's what Paul is saying, that he's now entrusted that with Titus, and that Titus could be, could be trusted. Titus was a convert of the Apostle Paul and had been discipled. And so Paul was saying, I want you to know that you can trust him. Second of all, we see a Christ-centered relationship. What was their bond? Oftentimes we have a bond with people because of common things that we enjoy. We find that outdoorsmen typically enjoy getting together, and as a result, they have a friendship. People who once served in the military can get together in a room having never met one another before and share stories and tears because of their service in the military. You have ladies that get together and they have a certain bond because of fashion and style. You have certain guys that uh, have a bond together because of the, the brand of truck that they drive or the brand of vehicle that they prefer and so on and so forth. Teenagers get together and they have a certain bond because of athletic bond or because of something that they enjoy or because of a specific college that they attend or that they prefer or that they like. Paul's bond and his relationship with Titus was based on the bond that brought them together, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the gospel, this common faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, this is what Paul would say as he preaches the gospel to the church in the city of Galatia, that it's no more Jew and, and it's no more Gentile and it's not male and female and bond and free that really matters. What, what really matters is this, is that we come together in the rich, red, royal, redemptive blood of Jesus. What brings us together as a church is the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus in our place. And then he closes with this Christian greeting, really a blessing that he bestows upon his son in the faith. And he says, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Grace, this word charis, literally means the, the wonderful love that God has bestowed upon his people. Grace, it's a reference to the saving love of God, the gift of God that comes through Jesus, and it's not according to works. And then we see the word peace, irene in the Greek. It literally means that of harmony or peace, to consider the fact that we were once under the wrath of God. We were once undone without God. We were once the enemies of God. We were once at enmity with God, and yet God has lavished his grace upon us. And so, as a result of God's saving grace through Jesus, we are no longer under the wrath of God. For the wrath of God has been satisfied in the death of Jesus in our place. And so now we stand presently at peace with God. Grace 
and peace. Notice what else he says. From God the Father. How did you receive this grace? From God. You didn't work it up. You didn't earn it. You did not deserve it. It wasn't because you were smart enough or good enough or moral enough or religious enough. God, our Father. And then he speaks of Jesus or Christ Jesus, our Savior. Christ Jesus, our Savior, is a means of putting forth high Christology at the very end of his opening greeting to Titus and subsequently to the church on the island of Crete. High Christology. What do you mean, Pastor Will? Note this. At the end of verse number 3, he speaks about God as Savior. At the end of verse number 4, he calls God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. He connects Jesus as Savior with God as Savior to bring home and to drive home this clear point that Jesus is one with the Father. Ultimately, that Jesus is God. And as we consider this goal and the ambition and the motivation of Paul writing this letter to his son in the faith, Titus, who would labor in love to set in order the life and the ministry of the church on the island of Crete, let us ask ourselves some honest questions as we come to a close. Is our life, our lifestyle, disorderly and disorganized spiritually? Do we not have any set form to our Bible study and our discipleship? Is our ministry within the context of the local church disorderly and disorganized? Or is it full of order? For the glory of God. Our God is a God of order, not a God of disorder. And so that's why the church ministry should be ordered in this way. Do you, do you see yourself as someone who is looking to be entertained by the church? To be entertained by the ministries of the church? To be entertained by youth ministry? Or do you see yourself as someone who is longing to have a certain feeling from the singing? A certain feeling, an emotional stirring? Or are you someone who is word-centered, gospel-centered, knowing God? That's what's the, the priority. And then when you have that set in place, it will then control how we feel and it will drive our emotions. When you understand what justification is and you understand what propitiation is and you're singing that on the screen, it will cause your heart to be overflowed with emotion and joy and gratitude and thanksgiving. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? One of the grand purposes of this very letter was an evangelistic purpose so that souls would be saved on the island of Crete. And my question for you is, are you a real Christian? Or are you a fake? Do you just come to church to pacify a spouse or a parent? Or do you have a longing to know God? It is my prayer as we walk through this very letter systematically, expositionally, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word, that you would come to have a grand appreciation for the ministry of this church as we as pastors seek to set in order the ministry so that you would know God, so that you would love God, so that you would serve God, and so that you would find your joy and hope in Christ alone. And if you're not a Christian, May you repent of your sins even now and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have genuine peace as you experience the grace of God knowing that you are no longer the enemy of God for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you and we thank you again for this joyful occasion to be able to come together as a church. We thank you for this privilege to be able to embark on this new study through Titus we ask that you would strengthen us and encourage us, and that you would lift us up in the faith. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen.